Coming up on the program, we're gonna harvest some spaghetti squash and see what happened with our butternut squash. And you wanna have Jerusalem artichokes all winter long? We'll show you how you can store them indoors without them going bad. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener is sponsored in part by For all your non-GMO, heirloom, organic, vegetable, flowers, and herb seeds, visit dollarseed.com. Sioux Growing Supply, located in Wausau, Wisconsin, focusing on certified leaf compost, an excellent amendment for poor soil, retains moisture, and adds nutrients, which equals less watering. Available in Sioux organic seed starting kits, pre-filled trays and pots, bag and bulk. Visit SiouxCompost.com. Don't poison your soil with municipal water. Attach a body, mind and soil hose and filter. Free shipping exclusively through the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. Just click on the body, mind and soil icon. Authentic Haven brand, soil conditioner for the home gardener. Easy to brew, 100% organic. Visit ManureTea.com. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. I'm Joey Baird. Getting later in fall and it's time to harvest our spaghetti squash. Now this bed here was an 80 square foot approximate bed that we had planted spaghetti squash on this side and butternut squash on this side. We did very small to little soil disturbance. Last year we came in here and mulched it with leaves very, very heavily, about a foot tall. And we're gonna do that here in the next couple of weeks as well. We let it set. We had virtually no weeds most of the year. And now there is some weeds that have come up now since the mulch of the leaves has biodegraded into the soil. We didn't have a very good stand of butternut squash, which is a disappointment because that's kind of one of the things we like to, uh, like to eat. Spaghetti squash is good as well. This is the only butternut squash that we have in this whole patch. It's a very small butternut squash. Now, with it being later on in fall, and we're gonna see this in a couple of them, when we harvest these, there's gonna be dirt on the backside and there's gonna be slugs. So you wanna remove all of that from, you wanna let it dry in the sun, the slugs will uh, go away on the, their own unless you wanna pick them off and, and throw them and other parts of the garden. So we have left these out here for a couple of weeks. You can see the vines, most of the vines have died back here. Some of these are green that they, they will change uh, over to a yellow color. Now, which is an odd thing that we have. We've got traditional spaghetti, I'm gonna cut this one off here, spaghetti squash that we're used to seeing, this uh, off yellow color. Then we also have this is a spaghetti squash that almost has a remnants of a zucchini, uh, a black beauty zucchini pattern. Now this could be for a couple of different uh, reasons. They all came from the same package of seeds. Uh, they could be at the time of the seed producer, there could have been some slight crossing of pollination in this. And that could be the reason why we have kind of a discoloration. That could be one reason. It could be there's some distant relatives of some different varieties in there. But nevertheless, this is going to be a spaghetti squash and it's going to taste just as good. Now, if you're thinking, well, why could it be cross-pollinated in the garden? It very well could be cross-pollinated with the zucchini that we have there in the straw bale and other parts of the garden. But the thing with pollination being cross-pollinated, it's pollinating the seeds that will grow next year if you do save them. It's not gonna affect the actual plant this year. Same thing with tomatoes. You may have two different varieties of tomatoes growing next to one another. The bees pollinate each of them, cross-pollinate. You're still gonna get a black beauty or a, a, a red a beefsteak tomato and a green zebra tomato this year. But if you save those seeds and they've been crossed, that's when you get that unique type of fruit the next year when you plant them. 
So this could be something that has happened uh, last year or when these seeds that we got were saved. But nevertheless, again, nothing, uh, nothing terrible about it. So we've got a number of squa uh, spaghetti squashes here. And here, see, this is another one that has that discoloration. Now, the way we're cutting these, and this is the way you wanna, we want to cut these off, even if the vine is dead, you want to leave about one to two inches there, simply for the fact that if you just cut it flat against it or you try to snap it off without using shears, scissors, or snips, you're going to open this top cavity up and allow some of that moisture to, ex to escape and that's going to greatly slow, uh, greatly speed up the breakdown process and it will not store very well at all. Now I'm going to go ahead and harvest the rest of these and we're going to see what we end up with. And then we're going to talk a little bit about curing these things so you get the most longevity out of storage when you take them into your house. All right, so we harvested our spaghetti squash and, we, and, and butternut squash and we in one of the weeds there up against the fence, we found another smaller spaghetti squash, or a butternut squash that is. So we have two here, and that may be enough for a little bit of soup if we don't decide to cut them up and fry them on the grill. Now, curing process on these. We wanna take these inside, just let them set on a counter away from direct sunlight, away from just in, in, you know, in a room for about two weeks at normal room temperature. Now, what this is going to allow this, these squashes to do is the skin will become tougher. It'll become denser. It, it will make it uh, harder is what the, the skin will uh, essentially do. That way it will kind of make a, a bigger barrier around the internal uh, portions of it and it'll keep a little bit longer. Now you can put these in a root cellar, uh, crawl space, basement, and they'll keep for uh, ad ideally three to four months. Now we've had some spaghetti squash that has kept for 12 months. You want to turn this stuff around uh, every about every six months is about the longest you really want to store this. Now if you don't have a basement crawl space or root cellar, another option that you may have is a room off to the side or a cabinet that you can put these in away from direct sunlight in the dark and away from further heat source. Other people will also store these just like this underneath their bed and that's a cool dry place that you can keep them you just want to you know check on them every couple of about a month or, or every month or so just to make sure that they're all still intact and you don't have one going bad on you but again spaghetti squash uh, butternut squash not a terrible harvest we've had some better we've had some worse but this will be a good start for our storage and use through the winter months Growing in containers is a great way to expand your growing area, whether you have ground to grow in or not. We're going to look at two different plants that we put in containers this year, and they're doing very well. One is, we've got two leeks. One's doing much better than the other leek, but this is just in a two and a half gallon bucket that we have drainage holes drilled around the side and in the bottom. We actually have some leek roots coming through the bottom as it's uh, growing. So leeks can be grown in a container. These are on the smaller side. Now the other thing that we've always, I've always stressed about is the containers need water. And if you're not on top of it, your plants are gonna suffer. We've seen this with stressed corn. We see this with this cabbage plant here. It's dry, it's wilting, it's ready to harvest even though it's not as mature and as large as we'd like it to. One key contributing factor to all of these is lack of water. This here is the kale that we had planted not very long ago, and we're actually using the top of our compost trash can bin as a water reservoir for this kale. Beautiful kale plant. You can see it's got a little uh, wilted here because of the lack of water. This is in a high three from Root Maker. We planted this along with the kale that we have in our hanging pot on the porch. Both are doing very well, as you see. And this is just another way that, you know, this kale plant, as we harvest it, it will grow all the way up to really hard freeze. And it will come back next year if we allow it to in this container. It's got a big, thick stalk on it. 
and because of the way this design is on the root maker, it continues to make more roots, roots to pick up more nutrients and moisture. So growing in containers is a great way to expand your growing area, whether you have ground to grow in or not. Okay, so we're going to take the rain barrels down. We set them up in the spring and now it's time where we're getting frost and freeze and we don't want to leave them up because we don't want to cause any harm. So right now it's draining into the garden. We're not going to waste any of the water. We're going to put in the garden, bring the moisture levels up and whatever is in the rain is, is good for it. And it's pretty, so while it's draining, what we're going to do is I'm going to take this off of here and I, there's a net here and I, um, when I put this up in the spring, I put this, well, it's actually a hair tie, but a rubber band around the net and then some duct tape or whatever this is around there. And then it just disconnects. And up here, I have to take that down as well. It's just connected by some tape. Pretty easy, and then I'll replace the, the downspout here. But there you have it, it's gonna drain. We're gonna make sure it's completely empty, take the hose off, wind it up, put it in the shed, and then it's ready to go uh, for next year. But it's pretty simple to install. Uninstall, just make sure it's completely empty before you go ahead and put it in the shed or wherever you keep them. So this is our Jerusalem artichoke patch or sunchoke as it is also named. Now these are our tuber plant. For, the, for some reason or another this year the plants tops were very short. Usually these are 8 to 15 feet tall. Some of the ones in the back are taller. It's a tuber that is very good for diabetics. It's low on starch and it can be eaten raw. You just clean it and eat it raw. So what we're gonna do here is, uh, the, the, the problem with Jerusalem artichokes is you don't see them in the store very much or at all because they have extremely short shelf life. As soon as you dig them out of the ground, they begin to get soft because they're exposed to the oxygen. So we wanna mimic the artichoke in the ground that we can have indoors because in the middle of winter, the ground is frozen and it's like four degrees outside and you ain't, you're not gonna be able to chisel any of these things out of the ground. So we did this last year as an experiment. We had heard other people talk about it. We're just going to take a bucket and you can have a bucket of any size that you want. And we're gonna mimic the, the Jerusalem artichoke in the ground. We're gonna add some soil, artichokes, soil, artichokes and soil. And then we have a stairwell that goes to our attic, which is pretty much what ambient temperature outside is. So it will get cold, but it's not really gonna freeze like a block of ice but it will mimic you know, winter conditions in that attic stairwell. Now we also did this with just artichokes in a airtight zip top bag and it worked relatively decent. We tried some in the stairwell, we put some in the crisper of the fridge. They did keep, but not as long as the ones in the bucket. Now we had about three buckets of these and I will warn you, if you don't go through all of these, as the, summer, as the spring begins to arrive, these artichokes in that attic stairwell began to believe it was time to grow and they began to come out of the bucket. So we had to basically toss those because, uh, and we replanted some of them, but they got, you know, they started growing. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take some soil. This is just a two and a half gallon bucket. Take some loose soil, just regular garden soil, nothing special. All we're trying to do is mimic the underground conditions. Now, if you do not know what Jerusalem artichokes look like, I'm going to dig some up here and we will take a look and see what we got. All right. All right, so here's what Jerusalem artichokes look like. Oh, they kind of look like, I don't know, like a ginger but they don't taste like ginger at all. That's a very nice, good cluster of Jerusalem artichokes. And you can see that you just bust them down and they'll break apart and you can eat them. Um, they do, uh, the longer they stay in the ground, the less chance of them allow, uh, causing you to have gas. 
So you want to be very cautious of how many you may eat at one time until you understand how they react, your body reacts to them. You can also make sun choke um, hash browns. And uh, we've done that, worked very well. Uh, we did add a little, a little more salt than what was recommended, but it worked out really nice. So if you're gonna harvest these just as is and take them in, you wanna do maybe enough for two or three days because they will go bad very, very quickly. And going bad meaning they will just shrivel up to nothing in a matter of just a few days. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna take, bust these off of this root cluster here and just layer them, and I'll layer them in there. Now, for example, that's all one right there. Now these can be, these will come back year after year. These will, uh, these are very, consider, they can be considered invasive. Wherever you decide to plant these in your garden, that's where they're gonna be permanently. You can also put these in a container and grow them and have them, you know, very isolated or raised bed. Now these have not spread any more than what we have put them in three years ago. We have never made it through this entire patch of harvesting them in a given fall. So keep that in mind, a little will go a long way. Now this one is on the soft side, so I'm not even gonna put that in the bucket. Uh, these two are firm. I wanna get good healthy ones in this bucket, and then I'm going to uh, cover them with dirt. Now we've had artichokes that were the size of baseballs that we've dug out of the ground. It appears this year is gonna be a very small sized harvest for whatever reason. So now that we've got one layer there, I'm gonna take some more soil, try to keep the weeds, rocks, and sticks to a minimum. And I'm just going to cover the top until I can't see them no more. And then, there we go. And then repeat the process until the bucket's full. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for more organic gardening and food preserving. I'm Joy Baird and this has been the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.